All right, everybody, welcome to Chat with Green Aggies. We'll wait for everybody to get in. A few more people connecting. All right, we are so happy to have everybody today. We know that you have a, a lot of choices when it comes to spending your time, and we're glad that you have chosen uh, chat with Green Aggies, and I just realized I sound like a flight attendant. Um, so thank you for choosing us. Um, you have many options. Uh, all right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, get started today. First, we'll introduce everybody. Um, I know Dr. Mung Mung Gu can't be with us today, but looks like everybody else is here. And so uh, I am Dr. Chrissy Sigers. I am at the Dallas Center, um, turf grass specialist, um, and we will turn it over to Dr. Uh, Erfan Vafai to introduce himself. Uh, hi, I'm from the Department of Entomology, but uh, deal in IPM with Greenhouse Nursing Ornamentals based out of Overton, Texas. Soon to be in Dallas. Soon. That's right. Yeah, soon, soon to be in Dallas come August. He's going to enter the crazy Dallas housing market very soon. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, Paul. Hi, I'm Paul Winsky. I am the uh, County uh, commercial horticulture agent down here in Harris County, uh, which is uh, encompasses Houston. Great, uh, Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Miller here in Tarrant County in beautiful downtown Fort Worth. Woohoo! Uh, Dr. Ong. Hey, I'm Kevin Ong, uh, base in College Station. I'm the plant pathologist, uh, uh, doing a lot of work on ornamentals and landscapes and tree fruit, and also direct our plant disease diagnostic lab. Uh, Dr. Bowling is going to be our first speaker, but she can introduce herself. Hello, I am Dr. Becky Bowling. I am an Extension Urban Water Specialist here at the Dallas Center with Chrissy, where I get to uh, just be on the same floor with her and look across from my office and, and watch her all day. Not I get to at complain all. about Becky yelling all the time. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> and then um, I see that Dr. Youngkey Joe is on, and we'll go ahead and let him introduce himself, but he is going to be our second speaker for today. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, I'm glad to join the chat with the Green Egg again, and uh, it's a beautiful day, and I'm looking forward to share some of the new fun stuff later. Ooh. Thanks. All right. Well, we got a lot packed in today, so we'll go ahead and get started with Dr. Becky Bowling talking about taking down summer weeds. Yes, and Chrissy, I have kind of designed this today um, for us to have some informal discussion as a group. So right. I may uh, prompt everybody to chime in where, wherever they see they can. And um, I will just say too, right out of the back, right out of the gate that um, I'm really excited about Dr. Joe's talk today. He's going to be talking about a topic that we get a ton of questions about, and he has some new research on this topic. So I'm excited to watch that talk today, and I'm glad he uh, is joining us today. So we're going to talk today initially about weeds, and um, I'm going to focus a lot today on some professional grade products. So I do want to have kind of a little disclaimer here at the beginning of our talk that if you are joining us and you're a, a member of the general public or you're a master gardener, um, these products may not be the right fit for you to use. Um, they're not necessarily restricted use. Some of them are, but even those products that are not restricted use or are not regulated explicitly by the EPA, they do require a certain amount of technical expertise, uh, calibrating, sometimes the use of surfactants, things like that. Um, and, and so still don't generally recommend these for the average user that does not have an applicator's license from the Texas Department of Ag Agriculture. But I will also talk about some resources that are handy for, um, for you guys as well. So if you're looking for some resources on, on some of these things, I'll share some of those today too. Uh, but we are going to focus a little bit more on professional things today, professional products. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about was um, this is a great time of year for certain cultural practices. And some of these uh, include cultural practices that Chrissy and I, for example, get a ton of questions about throughout the year. And we end up having to say, well, actually, the best time to do that is really like May. And guess what? It's May. So I wanted to start off talking about this today a little bit. And the first of these, a big one, is now is a good time to think about cultivation practices. Now, we are getting a lot of rain, which can make this a little tricky. We don't want to be out there necessarily cultivating in big, soupy mess of clay. 
Um, so that is something to be mindful of. You're going to want probably at least 48 hours of dry down after a heavy rainfall event before you do any of these cultivation practices. But the advantage to the rain is that it does soften the soil just enough that sometimes we can get an air fire into it without breaking the tines off. So that's some, some positive, a positive uh, way to think of this. Now, why are we talking about this as, a, as it relates to weed management? Um, weeds, maybe even more so than, than many of our other pests, although diseases can definitely be up there in this, in this um, way of thinking, but weeds are very indicative a lot of times when we see them in turf of underlying issues, problems with management, environmental issues, and it's very common for us to see weeds occur, for example, in turf grass systems where we have excessive thatch buildup. And the same is true for some of our diseases that, that you know, this thatch, which um, everybody defines thatch differently. So Chrissy, how do you define thatch? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Um, I usually think about it as that layer that's in between the soil and the crown of the plant. And it can be a combination of organic material, living or dead material that's kind of just built up in that location. It makes your, your grass feel uh, puffy, maybe like you're walking on like a mattress or something like that. And it can, it can lead to some scalping issues because it, that layer is pushing up uh, that crown of that plant. Now, um, what's your definition of that? Mine's probably about the same as yours. I use the word intermingling a lot because we get a very much an intermingling of living and dead material in that layer. And a lot of times kind of the target thickness that we're looking for is if we get above about a half an inch in thickness of that layer, we start to have some problems. It becomes kind of a nice nesting home for certain pest issues. So that's where we may see chinch bug activity, grub activity. We'll see uh, Rhizoctonia be active in there. We'll see Gamonomyces be active in there. Um, and so there are a lot of things that, that can like to hang out in the thatch. Now it doesn't mean thatch is all bad. We get some benefits from it, but it can get to a point where it becomes too thick. Um, because of the organic matter that we see in there, it can also become hydrophobic and repel water. And so it can create some issues that way as well. We can see that in some cases, uh, many of our zoysia grasses in particular, we might see something that looks almost like it's smothering the turf. And so when we have a lot of thatch buildup, we may see that the turf becomes sparse. Um, we may see that it struggles to stay healthy. It, it again could succumb to other pest issues. And then this creates a great window of opportunity for weeds to move in. Uh, likewise, when we have compaction issues, which are not uncommon um, in turf grass systems, uh, we similarly may see that the turf struggles to compete with weeds. Soil may become exposed, which increases weed seed germination and emergence. And so these are things that can definitely lead to significant weed issues. And so um, kind of monitoring that and, and using this time of year as an opportunity to address those issues through cultivation practices can be beneficial. Um, cultivation can include things like vertical mowing or vertical cutting, which are primarily focused on thatch management. Um, they can also include things like aerification. And we have a lot of different types of aerification, more than we ever used to. We have aerification that is solid tine, where we, we're putting spikes in the soil. We have hollow tine or core aerification, where we're pulling plugs. We have deep tine aerification. We have deep drill aerification, where we have little augers that can go as deep as 16 inches into the soil. We have um, shockwave air fires. We have air fires that use pressurized water, air fires that use pressurized air. So a lot of options, but our our goal is, you know, if we are seeing indications of thatch or compaction, this is a good time of year to address those issues because we do have some good natural rainfall that supports turf grass growth and recovery. Our temperatures are not extremely high. They're not extremely low. We're not going through a particularly dry period. We have good active growth. And so a lot of times, you know, we tell people late spring, early summer is generally the best time to cultivate. And so that's right about now. We also want to make sure that we're staying focused on balanced fertilization. We've talked about indicator weeds on here before. We know that we have some weeds that can really take advantage of turf grass systems where there are nutrient imbalances or deficiencies. Examples of this include our legume weeds, which can include cute things like white clover. It can also include not so cute things like uh, burr clover. Um, it can include things like sand burr. And so making sure that we're doing our soil testing, that we're making sure that we're meeting nutrient requirements 
nutrients in our turf grass systems uh, to keep our turf healthy, dense, competitive. That's the best defense against weeds. Same goes with our mowing and irrigation practices. Uh, as we move into a heavier mowing period, recognizing this time of year, you typically are gonna have to mow more frequently than you might other times of the year. If you go too infrequently, you're gonna scalp the turf. Um, and, and this is gonna create stress issues and this is gonna make it more difficult for your turf to compete with weeds. Similarly, we wanna have good balanced irrigation. This does not mean watering every day. This means deep and infrequent irrigation to promote healthy, deep root growth so that, again, our turf can be competitive against weeds. And the other thing that I wanted to bring up, because I am just seeing more and more and more and more problems with this in the state of Texas, is water quality concerns and the implications on turf grass management. We have many cities in Texas that have uh, are either using gray water, reclaimed water, recycled water in some form. The quality of that water may be questionable in some professional settings. That may be something we use on a golf course, certain sports fields, certain park areas. We also see that even um, some of our potable water sources, not great. The water in College, Bryan College Station area, not great. High in sodium, high in bicarbonates. This can not only uh, stress our turf grass out, but it has significant implications for our soils. It can degrade the soil structure over time, affect the root health. And so, you know, I think more and more I'm seeing cases where there's kind of a mystery problem in a turf scenario and the water hasn't been looked at. And then when we look at the water, the problem's not a mystery anymore. So if you've looked at everything else, but you haven't looked at that, it would be something I would encourage you to pay attention to, especially if you're using alternative water sources, wells, retention ponds, reclaimed water, whatever it is, um, that's, it's gonna be good to look at that. Okay, now, um, a lot of times, you know, when we think about pre-emergence herbicides, uh, many of us may be feeling like, oh, we've already missed the boat. The window's gone for the year, um, that, that's passed. And it's, I wanted to kind of take this moment to talk about our pre-emergence herbicide timing, the recommendations that you tend to see and what they're based on. So a lot of times the, the recommendations for pre-emergence herbicides in turf grass systems, we may very commonly see a recommendation to apply twice a year. Now, if you're in a, in a, a high input professional system, you may already be making more applications than that a year, minimum four, maybe in some cases, um, if not more. But um, in, many, in many scenarios, we see two. And a lot of times we see that the spring recommendation is to apply when soil temperatures hit around 55 degrees Fahrenheit, Depending on where you are in the state of Texas, this could be anywhere from mid-February to early March, depending on the year as well. So here in Dallas, I would say a lot of times this is kind of the third week of February is when we really start to think about this. Um, now, that recommendation stems primarily from a couple of weeds, really one weed in particular, which is crabgrass, right? So crabgrass germinates when our soil temperatures reach around 57 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we want to have a pre-emergence herbicide product out before that weed starts to germinate, because if you've ever had a crabgrass problem, you know that once it's up and once it's taking off, it's really, really hard to get it under control again. And we have very, very few products that are labeled to selectively control crabgrass once it basically gets past the first couple of leaves. Um, and so we really don't wanna be put in that position of having to control it post-emergently. Now, that being said, it is important to note that not every single weed does what crabgrass does. Okay, it may be a trendsetter, but it's not, it's not, not every weed is following in its footsteps. And we do have some weeds in the summertime that germinate at much warmer temperatures. And so if you did not put out a pre-emergence herbicide this year, or even if you did, but you see some of the weeds that I'm about to talk about or others that, are, that you know are annuals and you're like, what am I doing wrong? My pre-emergent is not working. It may be because those weeds are germinating or hitting peak germination at much warmer soil temperatures. And depending on the herbicide product that you use, the residual activity of that product may be largely worn off by the time those other weeds are starting to germinate and emerge. And so I wanted to talk about just a couple of these here. A personal favorite of mine that I get questions about from every corner of the state. Everybody loves this weed, right? Um, it gets stuck in your shoes, your clothes, your pet's paws, your kids will come in crying because they have one stuck in the palm of their hand after they fell. Um, so sand burr, uh, we've talked about before, it likes a poor soil. 
It likes a soil that's not especially nutrient rich. It likes the soil or a system where the turf grass is struggling and not competitive, where water is highly variable, okay? It can germinate as early as 52 degrees Fahrenheit soil temperature, but we see it hit peak germination at about 72 to 75. So depending on how quickly the soils warm up for the year, this may be a lot later than when we're really seeing crabgrass germinate. Okay, so that's one thing to keep in mind. So, so for example, with sand burr, what we might recommend, and the same is true for many of these that I'm about to show you, is a split or sequential pre-emergence herbicide application. And so if you know you have issues with these weeds, making a plan to make a second application per the label recommendations may be a good way to go. Here's another one, another one that I love, um, Spotted Spurge. It's a euphorb, so it's got a milky sap. <laughs> And um, again, this is one that can germinate fairly early around 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, but I don't typically notice it until later in the summer, most of the time. What about you guys? I see Laura nodding and Chrissy nodding. Yes. Um, yes. It's, a, it's also important to note that one of our most popular pre-emergent herbicides, Ronstar oxidiazone, is not very effective on this um, uh, annual weed. So if you've had spotted spurge in the past, you might want to pick a different different pre-emergent herbicide to target that. Yeah. I also wanted to say that the third week of February this year was probably not when anyone right. put out their right. pre-emergent <laughs> herbicide. <laughs> it's so that's the thing that makes it this so fun. I'm going to say fun and be positive in Texas is that Texas is a major weather diva. So really trying to, you know, we, we sometimes pre-emergent timing is presented as the weeds are sitting in the soil with a little calendar and they're waiting right. to fall <laughs> off a very particular date. And we may have a super warm week in January that leads to a weird flush of stuff. We may have a very late frost or a late warm up. I mean, it just, it, it's so, Monitoring soil temperatures, you know, a lot of times we tell people you want some pretty consistent temperatures for about four days before you make these applications. Um, and you can use it, you can buy a soil thermometer. If you're a professional, I would suggest just investing in one. I mean, this is something you do for your work. And if you're not a professional, you can use a kitchen thermometer if it goes low enough, which is the kind of the catch there. Um, but yeah, spotted spurge, we may see it really hit peak germination at 75 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And we, and, and once it takes off, Laura likes to use spurge in, as in her seven habits of highly effective weeds a lot, right, Laura? It's got some <laughs> especially fun characteristics that once it's up, good luck. It's got seeds in about an hour, <laughs> like about a hundred million of them. <laughs> So, so getting something out there to, to protect against it is, is good. Um, Laura, you may remember more about the, the, how quickly it produces seed than I do. I don't, I know you've talked about this in a talk before on here. Yeah. And I think it's like less than a week after yeah. emergence. Yeah. It's super it's fast. <laughs> it matures quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, last one is one that I see more in the south central and southern part of the state but i have seen it up here every once in a while um laura have you seen a lot of dove weed in tarrant county no but i'm gonna look for it more this year because it's been so wet yeah you know that, that this is a this is a plant that prefers more moisture than we normally have so what, what about you christy have you seen a lot of it up here um actually it's uh pretty prevalent in my uh, neighborhood oh yeah so, you've got um, kind of like a shady i could see it being like mm -hmm. a nice moist yeah, yeah and, I, and and we definitely over irrigate here so you know we irrigated this morning as i was getting up to go to the golf tournament i'm like why is it your why is the irrigation on just rain for like three days so you know yes we have a lot of dove weed in this location and, and then paul, paul i know that this is something i see every time yeah, i'm in houston yes yes we we get it on a regular basis probably in june we start to get the calls and the pictures of it and things like that so um yeah, it, we definitely get it down here. I would say it blends in a little more nicely with the St. Augustine yes. lettuce. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. It makes it hard to spot yeah. and it spreads by stolons. And when you're mowing, you can split those stolons and pick it up and move it all around your yard and the areas that you manage by accident. And it also sometimes, especially early on, it can be mixed up with sometimes Virginia buttonweed, which we mm -hmm. see in very similar environments. Um, but the, but the Virginia buttonweed is a, is a dicot. Doveweed is a monocot. It's in the what family, everyone? The 
the chat the spider wart family the, the camillanaceae family. family yes the spider the wart family. wandering traveler trascanthia uh, purple heart vine all related this is their not as loved cousin um yes so this is one that again we might see it germinate a little bit earlier in that kind of 60 to 65 range but it hits peak germination at pretty warm soil temperatures around 82 degrees fahrenheit and this is another one you know christy talked about not not every product's labeled for spurge well doveweed's another one that pre-emergence herbicides there are very few um that that are labeled for doveweed uh, in the grand scheme of what we have in our disposal. So paying close attention to the label, if you know you've got a, a big problem with a particular species, make sure the product you're using is actually labeled to control it. Don't assume that all pre-emergents are created equal. Um, okay, so that being said, I wanted to uh, focus on uh, kind of talking about, I, I wanted to talk about some products today that you may or may not be aware of. They may be relatively new or you just may not know about them. And from the pre-emergent standpoint, I wanted to focus more on uh, pre-mix products, products with multiple modes of action. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk about this is one, because we do see sometimes issues where the common go-to product may not cover as many weeds as you think it does. And so sometimes getting a product with multiple active ingredients, multiple modes of action is gonna help you have cover a broader spectrum of weeds. And the other thing is that um, pre-mixing or rotating modes of action that we use in our turf systems helps to prevent herbicide resistance. It typically takes longer for herbicide resistance to develop with pre-emergence herbicides, but it can happen. And with some of our pre-emergence products in particular, we don't want it to happen ever if we can help it. And just as a refresher, herbicide resistance is when um, herbicide or excuse me, weeds uh, essentially in a population develop the ability to resist the herbicide. So the herbicide is no longer effective. And the more that weed breeds and populates the area, the higher percentage of weeds that are resistant to the herbicide there are. And all of a sudden we have a population that we cannot control. Uh, with a particular mode of action. And so we want to do everything we can to prevent this. I, I think increasingly, you know, this has been something that's been very much on the ag radar for years. And I think turf kind of got away with like not having to worry about it too much for a while. And now we're really starting to see that catch up to us. We definitely have some herbicide resistance issues with annual bluegrass or poa annua. We're starting to see some certainly with goosegrass and certain other big weeds as well. So we do want to be mindful of this, especially if we are professionals and we're using multiple, uh, we have, you know, a more complex chemical program that we're using. So here's one, Chrissy mentioned this to me before our talk today, and it's a great one to talk about. And um, so this is Crew. It's relatively new, but it's a mixture of two products, two actives that have been around for a while. Um, and so it's got isoxabin in it, which you may know by the common name Gallery. And it also has Dithiopyr, which you may know by the common name Dimension. And um, as you can see there at the top, remember that these groups essentially correspond to a unique site of action. So if you're ever unsure about how to mix or rotate modes of action in your program, these numbers can be helpful, right? And making sure that we're using different things whenever we're planning out our program. Um, one thing that we see sometimes, um, even amongst professionals, is kind of a misunderstanding of what rotating your MOAs means. So um, we may see that, that people think that if I just change the active ingredient, that's all I need to do. But we have herbicide groups that have dozens and dozens of active ingredients in them. So for example, if I'm seeing uh, her potential herbicide resistance to the application of trifloxysulfuron, which is monument, Okay, that's one of the common names for that product. And I decide I'm gonna switch to forum sulfuron, which is revolver, which that's a very common swap that we may see is that somebody goes from one of those to the other. Well, those are the same mode of action. And so if, if I've got a resistance issue, changing from monument to revolver as an example is not gonna help me resolve that issue. I've, I wanna be very mindful of what the mode or site of action is for a particular product. And again, choosing products that have multiple sites of action can be helpful in preventing uh, resistance. And so um, isoxabin or gallery is a product that primarily offers uh, broadleaf pre-emergent control. So when we combine it with something like Dithiopyr, I've got another product here I'll show you in a minute that combines it with, I believe, prodiamine. 
it ends up kind of expanding our net of control where we may be able to get more broadleaf coverage. So, you know, I talked about, um, and I'll let Chrissy chime in on this here in a minute too, but, but probably one of the most common things I see on the pre-emergent side with, with people maybe not necessarily checking what the late, what it's labeled for is that they'll choose a product that's, that's great for covering annual grasses but they've got a ton of annual broadleaf weeds and most of those are not covered by the product they're using. That's probably one of the most common things I see. And so choosing a product that incorporates isoxibin is gonna really help you if you're seeing a lot of broadleaf annuals. Um, Chrissy, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, that I was thinking the same exact thing when you were talking about that. Super common to just say, I've got a lot of weeds in the yard and just pick a product and not really you know, know what those weeds are. But this is going to be a great product because we, we just chatted about this earlier, you know, um, sometimes we see some damage from some of these products on some of our shrubs and ornamentals, but this product pretty much offers a border to border solution. You know, I think there's like 400 and something ornamentals on the label this is safe in. And so this is going to um, open up, you know, a little broader use, but uh, with those two active ingredients come more, uh, a little bit more of a cost, right? And so every time we have more than one active ingredient in the tank, then it's going to be a little bit more expensive. Um, and just to be clear, we're not specifically endorsing any one particular product. This is yes. an example of a product <laughs> and there are many other examples that we'll talk about today. Exactly. <laughs> um, so here's another one here. This is called Gemini. So again, we see that same active down here, isoxibin, okay, combined now instead with prodiamine, which is another uh, pre-emergence herbicide that we may know as barricade, very commonly used in turfgrass systems. So same kind of benefits apply here that when we combine isoxibin with prodiamine, we broaden our spectrum of control in terms of the weeds that are covered by that product. Uh, here's another one. This one is pre and post-emergent activity. Um, and so not all of these actives that are in here are explicitly, you know, pre-emergent products, but it does contain a couple of things. So uh, prodiamine is going to be one that we use primarily for pre-emergent control. Simazine is one that could go either way. And then amazoquin, which is uh, in a product called Image, um, is going to be one that we use primarily for post-emergence control. So this is, again, a relatively new product. It's, what it really is, is a relatively new mixture of older products and older active ingredients that have been around for a little while. And I think um, that this is the first product that has combined imaziquin in a mixture. I think I before think this true. image was image and that was it. And, and so that's what kind of makes this one a little bit special um, to look at. Here's a couple of others. This one here on the left is uh, really intended more for uh, ornamental nursery production, things like that. But I did include it in here because I know we have a broad audience that we that we work with. And um, so this is one that combines, there's that isoxibin again, combined with trifluralin. So um, another version of kind of a, a, a premixed product. Um, another one here in the center is uh, freehand. So uh, another couple of different active ingredients. So there's many different options out there uh, depending on where you get your products, it may be worth asking, hey, what are some of the premix options that you have for pre-emergence control? Um, and like Christy said, these will come with varying price tags, et cetera, but, but it may help kind of open the door to a product that gives you a broader spectrum of control, helps you to prevent herbicide resistance at your facility. So maybe one thing to explore, um, or uh, you can also combine two independent products. It doesn't have to come in a premix. You can combine gallery with another pre-emergence herbicide product. Just pay close attention to what the label says about mixing. Make sure that that um, it's encouraged that you are mixing products together and that there's not going to be consequences to that. So again, this is to kind of help us keep in perspective that we want to make sure that we're focusing on herbicide resistance. We get, you know, I've noticed in, in doing a lot of extension programs that resistance is a very much at the center of discussion when we talk about insecticides and fungicides, not always sometimes when we talk about herbicides and it needs to start being more important. It needs to be something that's on our radar and that we're thinking about more. Okay, if you are um, watching and you are uh, not, not quite a professional, but maybe you're an enthusiast or you're a, uh, you're very studied in this, but you're not a professional applicator. There is a guide for you, um, that does uh, have this table in it that kind of breaks down some of the common active ingredients that we see, uh, in certain box store pre-emergence herbicides. And so you can download that for free. 
from the Aggie Turf website, and it'll get uh, this will get updated this year as well. But it's it just mostly updated in looks more so than than content. So, um, so this is something you can download. It's handy um, for the average person, or if you work with clientele that that um, want information on what's available to them at the box stores, this is a good resource for them as well. Okay, last couple of things we'll do, and I want to make sure I leave Dr. Joe plenty of time. So I'm going to try to be pretty quick here. Is just talk about a couple of these new ish post-emergence products that are out there that you may or may not know of. So uh, Vexus is one, it's a PBI Gordon product. Christy's worked with it more than I have. I, I think of it very much as a Sedge and Kalinga product, but I know it has some activity as you can see there on certain broadleaf weeds as well. Um, yeah, this is a granular product. Um, so Christy, what are your comments about this? Um, major comments are that it's safe for uh, all of our warm and cool season grasses, depending on what you have in your area. Um, I know they, like Becky said, they do push it primarily for sedges and Kalingas, even though it's got some other broadleafs on the, the label, um, primary use is going to be that sedge and Kalinga. You can notice, you know, group two herbicide. And if you've, if you've tried to control sedge before, um, the majority of our products are in that group two, um, the sulfonylurea group. There is, uh, at least one other one that, you know, is pretty commonly used on sedge called dismiss or sulfentrazone, um, and that's in another group, that's in group 14. So really we're kind of limited with our um, sedge mode of action rotation groups here. Uh, but one thing I will say about sedge control or Kalinga control, it's important to catch it early before those uh, underground structures like tubers and, and the rhizomes really get mature. And so really that's, that's about now or April, uh, about right now is the perfect time to, to do that. And so um, we really want to catch it in the early spring. Um, and so. Yeah, I always think of sedges as being kind of like icebergs, right? Like there's this little thing on top, but underneath there's going to be. So every, um, time, every time I hear tuber, I wish I could do an Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. So I always think like, it's not a tuba, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, something else that, that might be exciting about Vexus is um, in research trials, we are seeing some pre-emergent activity on sedge. It does have a, a soil residual, so it does have a reseed, resod interval of about 21 days, um, but that's not on the label quite yet, and so that's why we want to target that early post-emergent right when we start seeing it come up, but it should offer you some other control of, of sedge that hasn't come up yet, and so um, maybe we'll see that added to the label soon, but not yet. Um, here's another product. It's not super new. I was talking to Laura about this before we started. It's not super, super new anymore. Um, there are a couple of these aren't super, super new, but they're still relatively new. And I'm always surprised by how much people still may not be aware of products that are even a couple years old, just especially we get into a habit of, we gravitate toward the same products that we've known and used for years. And, and, uh, and so this is one uh, from Corteva called Game On. And it contains their new Arlex active. So if we go up here, it does contain multiple active ingredients. All of these, however, are in the same group, which is group four, the synthetic auxins group. And so that is important to note that just because we may have multiple actives in a product doesn't mean that we have multiple modes of action. And so still important to rotate this product with other things in your herbicide management program um, to make sure that we don't build up any resistance to this group four uh, synthetic oxygen group. And so it also does contain a 2,4-D choline. So this is important to be mindful of as we have some turf grass species that will be sensitive to this. So pay close attention to the label um, to make sure that, that the product is labeled for use in, this, in the scenarios that you're using it in um and uh raymond's actually on can is he does he have the ability to unmute I should <laughs> raymond you can't use this in lawns is that correct um you can't use this in home lawns it can be used in in what we refer to as industrial turf um so like if you if you had a you know a manufacturing facility and you had a lawn around that manufacturing facility or something like that or uh, you definitely could use it on that type lawn, but not a not a residential lawn for sure. Mm -hmm. And then it's also for golf courses. It's labeled for golf, and uh, it would be fine in a, uh, in say a cemetery. Can't be used on Bermuda grass sod farms either. Okay, interesting. Okay, good to know. Thanks, Raymond. Noisy sod farms would be fine. Hmm. Okay, cool.
<laughs> All right, last little one I'll talk about, and I'm going to hand it over to Yumki here in a minute. But um, last one is is going to be manuscript. This is another one that's a couple of years old now, but still may not be something we're aware of. And so uh, this is a Syngenta product, and so it offers some control. Um, of certain challenging grasses. So I know it's got, um, it's been a while since I looked at this label. Oh, there it is right there. It's got tropical signal grass on the label. I think it offers some Dallas grass suppression if I remember correctly. I think it's control. Is it control? Okay, yeah. So so yeah, so there's some some more challenging grasses that are on this label. And as Chrissy indicated, you know, sometimes finding a good herbicide for grasses and or sedges, some of our monocot weeds can be challenging. So this is one you can kind of add to your toolbox. So I'll say one more thing about that. You know, Becky was talking earlier about how if you're not as familiar with some of these products, maybe you should, um, you know, uh, either find someone else to help you or um, steer clear of some of these because manuscripts specifically will send you a pretty detailed um, list and say, you know, hey, you should use our a surfactant, you should do this, you should do that for the, the most effective control. And so they really want to, you know, cover themselves and say, we've told you exactly what to do. And if you follow those directions pretty closely, then it can help you control. But if you, you know, if you make a mistake, then it might not be as effective. So, so I'll just, before I hand it over, just the closing comments here, um, keep in mind, focus on an integrated weed management approach. Look for opportunities to boost cultural management practices to help reduce the need for herbicides and improve the efficacy of the herbicides that are used. Make sure that you always follow label recommendations as it relates to everything. The label is the law. So make sure that you're paying attention to what the rate says, appropriate use scenarios, your PPE, all of that's really important. Do not exceed maximum annual use rates for any of these products. Really important. We were just talking about, uh, Chrissy and I both have received emails this week of people that have used products off label over the last couple of weeks and killed other plants that they didn't mean to kill. So really pay attention to that. Do not take that for granted and be mindful of the potential for herbicide resistance. Rotate your herbicide modes of action in your program. All right, Dr. Joe, I'm handing it off to you. Okay, so let me share my slide. Uh, Dr. Joe, I saw your pecan board in the background there. <laughs> oh yes, I'm I'm work uh, pecan behind. Working the on turtle. pecans now, yeah. Can you see my slide? Yet? Yes. Yes, you're okay. not in presentation mode yet. Okay. All right, so let me let me talk about a little update on new disease. Uh, uh, Becky, maybe you, you you got this picture from the Jack, Jackson County a couple of days ago, and actually I I visited him. Actually, I didn't visit this site, but I visited the county agents, uh, Michael Michael Healer, and and then kind of know about this little backgrounds of it and. And is it's likely it's it's, uh, it's uh, it can be uh, fairy ring. So you can see this. You can see this is. Uh, can you see my arrow? Okay. So this is this is a stump. Here is a big tree here. Uh, and then they chop, you know, chop in the trunk. And then obviously there's big roots in the soil. It, it will be decompose many years, over 10 years, okay? So what happened is the, the fungus are eating this uh, organic matter for long times. And once the fungus growing and actually they're, they're around the tree, sometimes they're very green, greenish, okay? And then, but it's, you can see kind of ring patch styles of dead grasses, unfortunately, which is, uh, you can see uh, some mushroom popping up and sometimes spring or sometime in the fall, okay? And really they somehow grass don't, don't like it growing this area. And the grass, look, the, the soil is, looks fine and soft, huh? and then uh, a lot of organic matter, but simply the grasses, it's difficult to growing in, and then it growing over it, but it's uh, it's very difficult to 
uh, rooting inside those type of soil. I think it's, it's one part is there too much fungus growing. Uh, and our second is, is kind of hydrophobic area. So the grasses simply don't like it. And also, so it can be some, some seasons you have a dark green around it and overgrow, but it's, uh, you can see those kind of bare soils around. Okay, so there really there's, a, you know, the best option is you can take, talk, take this root out, out of the ground. <laughs> if you can, then it's reduced the, the fairy ring uh, permanently, but it's, in most of the cases, you can't do it. So it, it will, you have to deal with it and you can, uh, you can remove some of the soil, top soil, and then you put to the, you know, better soil. It, it, it fasten, fasten the recovery, the healthy growth growing over it. Okay. And so that's another option is easy fix, but you have to, you know, have to kind of deal with it because it simply those fairy ring is really difficult to get rid of it until those organic matters disappear. All right, see, start to seeing those, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> sign, sign mold, and it's funny to looking at, okay? So, you know, no harmful, just uh, mowing off, remove, and it will be okay and fun to watch. A lot of people start to complain why my grass is still bare ground. Uh, my neighbors looks fine, but it's uh, but it is uh, it is a uh, lot of you know damaged grasses. Are you still didn't fill up by this time? These uh, normal cases you should have all like this, but you still have a lot of empty stuff. And we have a lot of damage from the uh, you know February uh, you know winter storm. We still have a lot of you know turf is damaged from the winter storm. They they may not recover yet, especially if you have a zoysia grass, which is uh, they're very slow recovering. So if you damage in the winter time, and you know you still have uh, this kind of uh, bare bare grasses, and so. Uh, you know, relatively, uh, the, you know, Bermuda grass and, and San Augustine grass, so they, they're pretty good recovering if the patch was small, but if it's big enough, you still see those uh, empty spots. In most of the cases, they're kind of organic matter dry out, so it kind of stand out, kind of, kind of whitish background, so it's, <clears throat> it can be, you know, decreased the aesthetic quality, but but this is the best time that we got good uh, moisture in the soils and then temperatures warm enough. So the grass is really growing fast. So uh, to promote this recovery, you, you go re remove those uh, uh, organic matter. And then you, if you, if you, and then they kind of put some fertilizer in to, uh, to promote the growth. Okay. Or if you, the spot is too big uh, and then you, you can add in some, uh, you know, some good soil, garden soil mixed with the sand, um, and then fill in this hole. So, you know, the, if it's black, it's, it's less noticeable. If it's white, you're more noticeable. So uh, put some good soil, then it, it, it promotes the growth uh, recovery very quickly, so. All right, so <clears throat> this is a new, uh, you know, paper really excited about, uh, uh, lead by uh, my previous graduate students. So the, this is a Mycologia uh, journals, uh, recently published the title is Complexity, Complexity of Gomenomyces Species Causing Tech of, of St. Allison Rest in Texas, okay? So the Gomenomyces species is, a com is com uh, we have to know the Gomenomyces graminis uh, variety graminis. It's a long name. It's we call the short initial like GGG. We, we call the GGG all the time. And if you send the sample uh, to clinic or diagnostic lab, then you you diagnose as yeah you have a GGG on your grasses. So, but it's a really 
uh, surprisingly, there's not many study on this gomenomyces uh, or GGG group uh, in turf grass because uh, because something is uh, is to me is is because it's so complicated. And then then second thing is it the damage was not clear. I mean it's. Uh, something large patch or um, some rust, for example, if you, if you uh, outbreak and then they kill, wipe it, you can see the big patch of dead grasses or dead plants. It's very noticeable that you you kind of see that, yeah, if you have this rust or uh, this uh, large patch or rhizoctonia disease, you can see the dead plants, okay? So you have a clear connections uh, in between the cause and effect. But it's a, uh, in case of pecker root rot, we, we see all the time, but the uh, disease was not always linked to it because if you send this healthy looking grasses, you you still have this pecker root rot on the plant sample. So it does it how they how they do it in that uh, stolons or roots. Okay, so we start to collect some sample. Uh, I'm actually this lot of sample uh, throughout Texas. Uh, is Central and East Texas is coming to uh, the you know, Texas Disease Diagnostic Clinic. So they send, you know, obviously the, the, the grass, San Agustin grasses has disease it, or dying. And so they send the sample to confirm what, what the cause. And all of those are diagnosed as a GGG uh, and with all their other reason, but they, they found they found the GGG on that turf sample. Okay, so we we start to isolate it and then and and looking for you know some little little more uh, close looking at those uh, um, fungus. So if you're growing those isolation of this fungus uh, from the infected tissue, and they this is this is a petri dish, and uh, with the with the with the kind of uh, agar uh, mixed with the uh, uh, fungal growth media. So the fungus can grow in the, inside the petri dish, uh, eating with this uh, potato basis nutrition in clean environment. So we can actually looking at the, what is what is this fungus really looking like, look like, okay? And so uh, once, once we, <clears throat> isolated actually the kind of culture morphology, the color or the way they grow and the production of pigments as a slightly different. Okay. And, and then when, and the final actually confirmation, you actually, uh, you know, piece of DNA, uh, you, you have the PCR test because now we, everybody knows what's the PCR test. We do the COVID PCR test all the time. You already have PCL tests already. So same thing, we send the uh, send a, a piece of DNA for sequencing with the PCR and then confirm, you know, what kind of species, uh, you know, what, what kind of fungi is. And and also we kind of interesting when you grow in this culture, this fungus produce uh, uh, some spore, uh, uh, phallus spore. And then also they produce some uh, fruiting structure and we call the, uh, the sac-like structures, uh, 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 we call the ascus and they produce the spores, the ascus. And this is spores coming out of this uh, sac. And so this spore is actually, uh, you know, spread it and by the water or soil and then it germinated to become a, a, another individual's a fungus. Now, this is another, actually, this is a plant surface. Uh, this is the same, uh, this is a, a fruiting structures, uh, ascus. And then also typical, uh, the, the hallmark of this GGG is when you look at the microscope, the infected uh, tissue, this is the mycelium, thread like structures of fungi. And then this is called the uh, hypopodia there's very unique uh, structures of the fungus, like flower-like structures. And not any other fungus are 
growing uh, on this on the plants, they don't produce any kind of this uh, unique structure hypopodia. So if you see those hypopodia and you confirm that yeah, this is gomelomyces, but it's uh, <clears throat> we know that G, this is all GGG it used to be named as GGG, but it's uh, there you can see the morphology and then the <clears throat> size of spore. Uh, are slightly variation. So we suspect that there, there is it's not the same species, but we just put together in a one, one in a big groups. And the recently uh, there's uh, some new uh, taxonomy of this uh, agomeromyces group has been uh, you know, improved. So based on the DNA, uh, <clears throat> actually we found uh, this three GGG, the old name actually separated to three different species, which is a uh, uh, Gomeromyces floridanus, uh, Gomeromyces roxii, and uh, uh, Gomeromyces graminicola. So, so, okay, so we have uh, at least there it could be there's a other species that are there. Then I will show you later the the, the is, is is more complicated than, than we expected. But I just saw the three different species uh, that is used to be GGG. Okay, so we we know there is a different species out there, and and we know there is cultural uh, morphology on the petri dish, and they they look so slightly different. Okay, and. And, but also the more important thing is aspect is, is are there uh, virulence or they are aggressive to infect the plants? Okay, that's the kind of important question for us. So this is this is a rice uh, root. And so the control, you can see the white <clears throat> root, which is a clean root. But if it's in, in, in artificially infected with the dist three different species, Progenitus, uh, Roxii, uh, Graminicola. The <clears throat> you can see that the grass, the the, the rice roots uh, become very dark. Okay, and so the the darkness, uh, like especially uh, Floridatus, you can see this lot of darkness, a lot darker, and then the root length is uh, can be short, and also the above ground or plants also. Uh, compromised by this uh, infection. So uh, <clears throat> when you when you compare those uh, three different species and there's a root, di root disease so higher bar is uh, is more disease. So the uh, Floridatus has uh, their higher uh, virulence and also this is a 26 day after inoculation. This is 42 days after inoculation. So that means there is a, uh, some species are more virulent. They cause more disease uh, than uh, than the other. And all the shoot lengths uh, is also, you know, the shoot lengths are kind of shorter than the other uh, group of uh, fungi. So. Yes, there is there is a different virulence, uh, you know, depend on what kind of species uh, are infecting the, the grasses. So <clears throat> the the reasons I used uh, you know why why didn't use the turf grass instead of uh, rice. Okay, so there's a you know a couple reason is it's very difficult to inoculation study on uh, turf grasses, I would say. And especially St. Augustine grasses, you have, there's, there's no seed. So you have to use some clean um, stolen for testing this uh, virulence or called the uh, pathogenicity assay. Uh, we, we, cannot, we, cannot get a, we cannot get those clean, uh, Stolen or sand housing grasses, vegetatively, vegetatively growth is very difficult. So we have to use kind of alternative. 
And 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 then the second thing is, uh, even if you inoculated a lot of this fungus on say analysis rests, they never they never produce a disease that you usually see in the field. Okay, so so we have to have some kind of alternative method to measure those virulence. So we use the rice, and the rice also uh, one of the hosts of the gomenomyces. Uh, but recently, uh, <clears throat> didn't publish this this paper. But it's a recently, and we developed the uh, we can actually uh, run it uh, the Bermuda grass with the seed. Uh, we, we we buy the seed and we, we produce a, a clean seedling, and then we can inoculate it this different uh, species of gominomyces. Actually, you can see uh, we can test the virulence. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so in general, this one, even if you inoculated this uh, uh, this uh, gomenomyces in, in Bermuda grass or or rice, they're not kill completely wilt uh, of the uh, plants. Okay, this is different from the rice actonia. If you rice actonia inoculated, they they even not germinated. Okay, and then they're they're kind of smoked of whole plants. But is the uh, gomenomyces? They're growing uh, on the roots. The plant seems to be okay. They they grow. They tolerate it at a certain point. But is uh, uh, we recently found it in based on the Bermuda grasses are you know they compromise the growth. They they compromise growth of the root. They compromise the 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 height of uh, growth. Okay. So it, it's, it's not total death because of this gomenomyces. However, they, you know, compared to the, uh, you know, normal growth without this fungus, the growth or growth of roots and growth of height uh, of plants maybe is reduced by, you know, 20% to 30%, 40%, something like that, okay? So that actually makes sense uh, for us, we kind of know what you know what's what, what why they didn't kill it, but yeah, it's not killing the grass because of this gomenomyces, but but it it is it is compromised the growth of turf grass. So they give additional twenty or thirty percent of stress on new grasses. All right, so this is can be complicated, but this is the kind of the beauty of of. Uh, can, can explain the whole thing, the complexity of the gomenomyces. Okay. This one, this graph, it doesn't even include the other half of a gomenomyces species. So there's a lot of gomenomyces species here, and this is a group based on the genetic uh, uh, similarity. Okay, So we found, <clears throat> uh, basically, you can see those are three d clade, three d clade. Okay. Uh, uh, or rhizicus clade, so coming from the rice or rhizy, and then a graminous clade, and then from side clade. So the wheat basis, or this is gray, graminous, some kind of grass clade, okay? Within this rhizinous clade, uh, we, we found gomenomyces graminicola, and we find this graminicola uh, uh, floridanus, and and also the here gomenomyces origenus. Uh, this is an infecting uh, rice. Also, it, it called the uh, uh, cheese rot or black cheese rot or uh, the crown cheese rot in rice. Okay, so this is uh, also uh, causing uh, in, in some damage on rice. And so we have uh, two species are belong to. This, uh, you know, origenous clade, okay, and and also and then uh, uh, and the other one is gomenomyces araxii, actually in the group of uh, exotridicide clade. So there is a gomenomyces gomenomyces which is uh, uh, gomenomyces infecting, or and then cause takeoff patch and wheat is a big problems in, in wheat 
Okay, so this is called a GGT, used to be GGT, but now they call the Gomeromyces tradesi. And then uh, Gomeromyces avini, this one used to be a GGA, okay? This is oat uh, infecting Gomeromyces. So the Gomeromyces looks like they're more closely related to the GG, GGT, old name GGT or GGA previously. And then they're, uh, as based on our pathogenicity, there uh, is a less virulence than group of the, uh, the orogenous, orogenous clade. And so uh, <clears throat> we recently, we, we're trying to uh, work on the Bermuda grass, uh, uh, gomeromyces uh, work, take all root rot. And we found we found also Gomeromyces araxii, and also we find lots of uh, uh, Graminus graminicola, and graminicola uh, is relatively virulent uh, to the plant. Okay, so it is interesting that uh, we have a uh, different group of uh, fun, you know, fungi Gomeromyces are associated with Teco rubra, and St. Allison grass and Bermuda grass, and and if you have a graminicola species, uh, you, you can have uh, more uh, pressures, uh, you know, the disease pressures on, on the plant. Okay, so, uh, you know, you, you maybe it depends on your uh, budget and depend on your uh, expectations. You may, may not, uh, you know, consider as controlling some fungicide program uh, targeted for the this uh, graminicola species, but if you have a raxii, maybe you you can you can just you have a very small amount of uh, damage uh, from this. So, so the kind of summary is we uh, this study actually showing kind of a lot of explanations what what is the current status and and confusions of why what is the take of rubra. It's kind of widely spread, but it's, it's not, not killing the grass because of it, but it is compromised growth. So if it's home loan, uh, you know, low end uh, turf, uh, it may not be big of big of deal. I mean, the plants still survive, uh, even if they got stressed. But it's, uh, but it's the grasses, all, if it's grass, it got a lot of stress from the other factor. It's mis, uh, mis, mistreated or uh, mal, mal, uh, malpractice and uh, bad environments, too much water, uh, high traffic, and you know, too less water. In, in addition to this uh, take of root rot, you know, additional 30 to 40% suppressors that will damage your grasses. And, and if it's high end golf course situation, if you have those uh, uh, graminicola, graminicola, graminicola and, and your putting green, I, I think so we have to uh, you know, keep eye on it and then we have to develop some good management practice because it, it will compromise the plant health. So that's all I have. And I hopefully I get some uh, you know, follow-up study and, and more, um, more information about uh, the Bermuda grass later on. Well, um, I think we can all see that uh, take-all root rot is much more complicated than we've ever thought. Uh, we, we always knew that it was uh, quite a tough disease to deal with. Now we have potential of three different uh, varieties of that fungi to come in and, and take up um, on our grass. And so, uh, Dr. Joe, I don't, I'm not sure if Dr. Ong's still on here, but I know you, you talked about, um, if we had one versus the other versus maybe a couple of them, will our lab be able to differentiate between that? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, based on, usually you can get those uh, infected plants, right? And then right. the, the the mycelium all looks like a dark uh, ectotrophic uh, root running hyphae. So it, 
you there's there's no way you can tell the differences and if you isolate it from the clean petries i just show you yes you can tell it but it's also isolations of this uh, mycelium even you can see the myceliums on on the stolen isolation of fungus uh the pure culture is a, is a is a challenging uh it's you need to clean environments and then you have uh some experience uh some making selective media and then so so it is a little bit challenging that you can you can identify with uh, uh you know. so for identifications i you know for now you, we have to we have to culture them out first okay and then uh, i can tell based on the culture but it's for the confirmation so we can you know pcl test is is the best way yes well we uh definitely appreciate you coming and sharing your new research with us and um, very interesting, very interesting. We have a lot of, of uh, different types of fungi out there and a lot more uh, things to think about and deal with than we realize, I guess. Um, it looks like uh, Dr. Bowling showing some um, updates where we can watch uh, Plant Clinic on our YouTube channel. Um, you wanna talk about that, Becky? Sure. So yeah, just a couple of little closing things. Um, so you can go back and watch archived Chat with Green Aggies, previous webinars, episodes, whatever you want to call them, on the Texas Plant Clinic YouTube page. So um, please, if you missed something or if you want to just go back and, and rewatch something because you just found it so exciting and interesting, uh, please go check out the YouTube page and, and watch us there. Um, Airfarm put a link in the chat already. Here's the QR code as well. So please, um, if you're willing, if you have a minute or two, um, provide us some feedback. It really helps us out, helps us uh, build better programs, and it also helps us uh, kind of track the impact of what we do. And so um, you're really doing us a favor and, and also making sure that we can continue to serve you and answer the questions that you guys have. So um, please take a moment to fill out our survey if you haven't already. I uh, also wanted to share, this is the rest of our May schedule. So um, as Chrissy said, unfortunately, uh oh, unfortunately, Dr. Gu couldn't be with us. I would make her do the plug for her native perennials talk, but I'll just read the summary that she sent me. There are many Texas native perennials that survive and thrive in Texas heat and could be great landscape plants. We will look at some options and how they could be used in Texas landscapes. And there are, we have a lot of great natives here that in my opinion are still, they're more utilized than they used to be, but still way underutilized and can be great bloomers, bring all the bees to the yard, a lot of great options. I'm excited for that talk. Paul, do you want to do a little plug for your irrigation water sampling talk? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, the main thing, the key here is, um, yeah, a, a lot of growers may not know the quality of their water. And so if you're starting out behind the eight ball with uh, poor quality water, um, it doesn't matter what type of fertilizer you use, what type of soil you use, your plants are going to suffer. So um, just being able to collect that sample properly um, and send it off and um, have an idea of what you should be looking for once you get those results. Awesome. Yeah. Like I said earlier, I think we're seeing more and more that this can really be a challenge. And there is truly, there are some changes in the quality of water across the country. As we see depletion in groundwater resources, the quality is changing in some of the groundwater that we use. And that is definitely true for Texas. Texas has some regions, particularly along the coastal bend, where we see significant depletion. And what happens is, uh, you know, deep groundwater and water from under the ocean moves inland and upwards. And so it changes the quality of our water. And we also see an increased use in, in reclaimed or recycled water sources. So really good to monitor that, look at that, know how it affects everything about your management practices. So I'm excited that Paul's going to talk about that. And then our last week of the month, we're going to try something different. We're going to be doing a checklist as a group. Um, and so we're going to be talking about, is the landscape ready for summer? So this will be a great review of, um, different things for professionals, green industry professionals to kind of make sure they check off as they're the facilities they manage, the clients that they manage, et cetera, as we're moving into the hottest, most wonderful time of the year here in Texas. 
uh, when we reached those triple digits and not a whole lot of rain, I was just, I caught myself complaining to my husband last night about our rain. And then I remembered that a month from now, I'm going to miss it. <laughs> so I shouldn't say anything. So, um, so yeah, so uh, keep an eye out for that as well. Um, that's all I've got. I don't know if any of you guys have anything else to add. All right, nope. Air, Airfon, anything from, from our technical leader on, on anything we need to no, nope, just uh, if you have a chance to fill out that survey, please do. Uh, that's in the chat, but that's, I mean, that's it. Oh, one more thing I did remember. If you have a chance to fill out the survey, please, please fill out the survey. <laughs> I don't know if you picked up on it. It really helps us out. So Absolutely. Um, okay. Well, um, you guys, I'm going to shoot you an email. If you guys, do we have time to meet briefly after today? That would be good. Awesome. Okay. I'll send a link. And uh, to everyone else, thanks for joining. And we'll see you next time here on Chat with Green Aggies. Have a great week. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.